Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage, and I am joined by Dr. Erica Riggleman. We're back for another edition of Thyroid Answers Podcast, and this is the holiday edition. We're, we're going to uh, do this, uh, this, this podcast and get it out for the holidays, so we can give you some tips for how to deal with hypothyroidism for the holidays, right? Sounds great, doesn't it? Absolutely. I got my, uh, my shirt on today, my, my reindeer shirt. <laughs> I, would, I was almost said you have your ugly Christmas sweater on, but it's not an ugly Christmas sweater. It's actually a very nice Christmas Yeah, you sweater. apparently didn't get the memo. You have red on. I have red on for the holiday, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm very limited. I have a very limited wardrobe. I think this is my one red shirt. Everything else is <laughs> some, level, some color of blue, um, which isn't necessarily seasonal. Yeah. Um, but this is it. This is the best you get from me. <laughs> so let's talk about... Dealing with hypothyroidism, especially down the holidays, I mean, it's a big issue. I know for me and my patients, uh, you know, we just, we're just getting started with them. Maybe we've started seeing them in October, November. We're just figuring out the anti-inflammatory diet. And now the holidays come, right? Mm -hmm. And things go wonky and go crazy. And it could be a real issue for people because they just started making improvements and now they go back to a dietary pattern that maybe creates more stress and we want to be talking about that the other issue is you have the other thing that occurs which is people are become so stressed out during the holidays because they're going to family they're going out to eat and they're so stressed out about what they can't put in their mouth or what they can't do that that actually creates more stress on the system and they'd be probably better off just enjoying themselves a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, th I think the, the stress component of it is, is really, it's huge. And you may not even understand the, it may just be the, the idea of having to buy gifts and it, maybe it's money. You know, the, the holidays just bring stress to begin with just because there's so many events, you know, pressure to buy gifts, to get them, you know, time constraints. Um, so I think that, you know, having an outlet for stress and, and being self-aware of the amount of stress that you're being put under, um, and you just think you can go, 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 and I'll rest after the holidays type of thing. You know, you, you can't necessarily do that because again, that stress can build up. And once you do get past the holidays, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're not going to have long-term issues that sustain from having that much stress. So I think that while it's going on, finding ways to have outlets for stress, whether that's making sure you get your workouts in. If that's your way of de-stressing, then, then do that. Taking time for yourself. I think that, you know, whether you have kids or you have families in town, I think that you find a way to, whether it's going on a walk or, you know, taking a, a hot bath, finding a way to, to have a, that stress outlet you know, maybe practicing some meditation. We've definitely talked about meditation before. Um, maybe finding that that inner peace and that that moment where you can just kind of be grounded again and and realize that you know this is a holiday. It is going to pass. You in trying to time manage, I think, is really really important. I'm mean, obviously we're we're only a few days away from Christmas, but you know preparing is another you know good thing that you know as holidays come up in the future you know, be, being prepared, not waiting to the last minute to buy gifts and, you know, prepare food or even to think about it because that is when it gets stressful. And when you try to go to the store and things are already gone and that just adds more and more stress to it, I think. So I think stress is a, a big component that we don't see. We don't see stress, um, but it definitely can weigh on us. Yeah. And I, I think we, we need to classify there's, everybody's going to have stress. You're never mm -hmm. going to avoid stress. And there's good stress. We call that you stress things that you stress your body and it's actually helps and it's good, good for you. And then there's distress and that's the stress that kind of breaks you down a little bit more. You really need a balance of both. And both of those things are beneficial. And really what we're talking about is how to manage some of that distress. And sometimes you're not going to be able to get away from, Hey, the family's coming, got all these things to do. You're not going to be able to get, a, get rid of all of that stuff. So you don't have to really get rid of it all, but you do have to have something to kind of balance out the scale, like the old teeter-totter thing. Just balance it out a little bit. And so what we want to do today is we want to talk to people uh, about what are the things that you can do if you've got how to reduce your stress load, how to balance the stress load. If you're on a, you just started an anti-inflammatory diet, if you're gluten-free, dairy-free, what do you do during the holidays? What are some of the strategies that people can use to reduce the negative stress so it has less of an impact uh, on the system so they get through the, the holidays happy and healthy 
because during the holidays, I mean, there is stress. I mean, the shopping, all that stuff that goes on and the preparation and the travel, those are all maybe distressors, but they're balanced many times if you allow it by the bonding with family and friends. And so there is that plus and minus. It's we just want to make sure that we give you the, some tips so that distress maybe isn't such a big deal. So one of those things we want to do is well, let's start with let's start with food and 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 thinking about meal prep. Let's say let's talk about strategies. I, I'm let's say you're a person who uh, you have a patient who's just really getting started on an anti-inflammatory diet, right? And this is like that first month or so is really the time where they're really trying to figure out how do I go from my standard American diet to this anti-inflammatory diet. And it can be very stressful because you're very, a lot of times people get super worried about every little drop and morsel they're putting into their body. What strategies would you give to the person who is now a month into an anti-inflammatory diet where they've made, maybe had control of their eating. Um, and now uh, they're going, they have to go to all these events and homes to eat and they don't have control. So what, what advice would you give to somebody in that situation? I think preparing is probably the number one biggest thing that you need to do, whether that be you prepare several dishes, whether it's a whole dish for everybody or you have your your individual portion that you want to take with you, but prepping to to know that there's going to be at least something there for you to eat. You know, if you know the the host or whoever's house you're going to, you can ask for menus ahead of time. Ask for you know you know it, people want to be accommodating. You know, if they know you have a sensitivity or they know you're on a you know a restricted diet, you know, if you're not a burden to people, you know, ask them, you know, well, what's in it? And if they, they can't give it to you, then obviously you just stay away from that. But I think being prepared, the last thing you want to do is get to, you know, your in-laws house or your, your, your work party and you'd have nothing to eat. That's where you get in that situation where you're like, well, I'm starving. And you, then you scan the room for the, the least, the least, you know, uh, harmful culprit. And, and then oftentimes you just indulge in everything. So I think that being prepared and bringing something or eating before I tell a lot of my patients, if they've got to go to a wedding or a buffet or something, you know, eat before you go. And then if there's, there is something you can eat, then obviously you can be a part of that to, to have that social interaction, but, you know, eating before will then mean that you're not going to, indulge too much in some of the stuff that's that's bad and and at the end of the day sometimes you're in a situation where you you weren't planning it you you end up at a party where you 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 weren't planning to go to that party and and then at that point you just have to make the best decision possible you know try to try to find the things that are the you know look for the vegetable type of stuff look for you know whether it's salads or you know some most time Meats in most cases are going to be a, a safer bet, you know, unless there's seasonings and things on that. But, you know, if you're going to a holiday dinner, a lot of times, you know, turkey or the meat is a fairly safe thing or a vegetable. You just be careful of the gravies and the, the pies and stuff like that. So pinpointing those things that you already know, like, for example, for me, when I was going to, to my in-laws for Thanksgiving, I asked ahead of time, you know, what is the meal plan? What is this? And, you know, one of the things that they were going to have was the, the dressing, which I know isn't going to be, they're not going to make gluten-free. They don't, they don't know how to make that stuff. So that's one of the things that I knew for my family that we, we were gluten-free. I made ahead. I made a gluten-free dressing to take with us so that we felt a part of that, you know, and I made a dessert so that we, we, we could eat the things and not feel left out that everybody's having dessert or, you know, I think that, so again, the prep I think is the biggest, biggest thing that, that, that you can, you can do ahead of time and take with you so that you know that you have something that you can eat. Yeah. And I, I think those are all great, great um, recommendations and I'll kind of go through my list as I was listening to you. Definitely. I think if you're going someplace else, and most times when you're going to an event, you have to bring, you're usually bringing something anyway. So bring, bring something appropriate, whether you tell everybody it's, you know, it's, you know, hey, that's gluten-free or whatever is up to you. But what I know from experience and you know from experience is many times some of the gluten-free foods that we make, when we make really good gluten-free foods, they actually taste 
sometimes better than the real thing. I mean, and this is, you know, I don't know, we've had this experience with, in our house, with my kids as they're growing up and, you know, you have a, if there's a birthday, then there's the gluten-free cookies and there's the gluten-full cookies. The gluten-free cookies will go way faster than the gluten-full cookies. And I don't know why, but they, they actually taste pretty good. But the, but there are, sometimes those options are fine. So I think it's one of those things, if you're going to somebody else's house, find out what you can bring so that you can control that piece of it. So whether it's salad dressing, it's the salad, it's the meat portion, it's a dessert, you know, and you can make it like in, in our family, everybody, you know, our, my three sibling, my two siblings and my family get together. And, uh, and when we have that group of, you know, you know, 13, 14 people coming together plus extended family, you know, not everybody's gluten free, but almost everything that's made is gluten free because there's a number of us that are. So we've transitioned, but in the early days we would make it. And my family was very accommodating to say, Hey, well, let's, we'll try and get a, a gluten free version of it. And many times you wouldn't even know. And if it's the holidays and you're making a filet, you know, making a filet roast or something that can very easily be made gluten free. And so it, you, you just try and, and, and bring what will make uh, meal planning for that person easier, but also make your life easier uh, because you have control. Definitely one of the strategies we're going to a party tonight is always eat before you go. Uh, mm -hmm. You control what you eat before you go. The chances are then you're going to snack and, and limit uh, what you eat more. Um, and usually, you know, most people, when you go to, like when I go to the neighborhood party, there's all, there are a couple of people in my neighborhood that, that are gluten-free. Uh, but the vast majority of the food is not a not not now this house this party will be top notch. I mean she goes all out, so this will be gourmet <laughs> food. But if you go to just a regular party, I mean it's usually not maybe the highest quality. It's because you're serving the masses, and I and I get that. So I I prep that. I think eating before you go, make sure that you're satisfied before you go. That'll stop you from doing a lot of cravings. Um, the other thing to talk about is like enzymes. I mean if you know you're gluten, you need to be gluten free, and you're highly reactive to gluten. Uh, there are some enzymes that you can use that can help mitigate some of the damage. If you know you're dairy intolerant or lactose intolerant, there's enzymes that you can use to do that. Is that a long-term answer? Uh, it isn't. And I would definitely caution, caution people about the DPP before enzymes that are out there for, um, for gl breaking down gluten. And, you know, you can take those on a regular basis. The problem is you need that enzyme to help with blood sugar control. And so if you start taking that on a regular basis because you want to blast your body with um, uh, lots of gluten, and then you're going to probably have blood sugar problems, okay? So we won't get into the mechanics of that, but just know that there, there can be rescue thing tools short term, but there are enzymes you can use like, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to eat that, and what else, what can I do? I know I'm going to have some. You, well, there are enzymes you can take that can mitigate it short term, but don't get yourself caught up long term that that's the best strategy. Uh, the, other th the other thing I'll throw in is since we're talking about supplements is activated charcoal. That's another one that if you go to that party, you know, you didn't prep, you didn't take your enzymes, you, you ate some of the food and you come back and you feel really icky. Some uh, activated charcoal is a good thing to maybe bind up some of the, the, you know, toxins and things that you may have ate to kind of get it out of the system. So that's, I tell people that that's a good kind of rescue remedy. It, you just, again, just like the enzymes, be very cautious taking that, you know, on a long-term basis because it can bind nutrients, vitamins, any supplements, medications you're taking. So you use it as more of a rescue remedy. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the next one I had was self-control is limited. So realize that the you can only be around that chocolate chip cookie that looks so good for so long. And eventually you're going to eat that chocolate chip cookie, right? So self-control is limited and don't feel like you're a bad person. If after three days, three parties in a row, you're going like, I got to have that. We all have a, a limited amount of self-control. We typically have a lot more in the morning when we start the day. And as the day goes on, that self-control goes down and we start to go for it. But I think you, you really have two choices. And one of those is either don't, don't choose not to do it. Or if you really choose to do it, don't beat yourself up, right? If you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to feel guilty about what you did all day, plus feel bad potentially because of the food you ate, that's a double whammy. 
my suggestion is, look, I, I'm, I'm going to go to the party. I'm going to have something. Don't beat yourself up for it for the next two days and be angry with yourself and have negative self-talk. Just commit to it and say, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of it. And then the other thing that goes along with that is see what your body tells you, right? Hey, man, I was really didn't feel well after that. Great. That's telling you you're still probably pretty sensitive to or intolerant to that food. You probably shouldn't do it on a regular basis at all, but be aware of what your body is telling you. I didn't feel good. I felt, you know, I was sick to my stomach. I had headaches, my joints ache. Yeah, that, that gives you that clue that still, I'm still, still reactive to whatever that was. And I probably shouldn't do that very often. So I see a lot of people just so stressed out about everything about, Hey, I don't know what to eat. I can't eat. I, you know, everybody's going to look at me like I'm crazy. Look, if you're this stressed out and you haven't even gotten to the first party yet, this, all this, perceived stress is going to be your issue. It will, it'll, it'll be the bigger issue than the food. So make a plan, make a strategy, like the things we're talking about. And then if you do eat something, don't beat yourself up. Just be aware of how your body feels. People are always going to, people are always going to be like, well, why aren't you, you know, you eat this or grandma's always going to be like, it's just one cookie, you know? And again, it's, it's that self-control that, you know, when I go to a party, most people at this point, you know, our neighborhood party was last week and people were, people know that I'm gluten-free so that they know why I'm not eating all the food and it's, it's not being disrespectful to the host or anything like that. And they, they know that. So, and again, when people are like, Oh, it's so good. You should try it. I'm like, you know, you, you enjoy, you, you got it. I'm, I'm good. I, and sometimes they'll just say, Oh, that would make me sick for days. And they're like, Oh, Oh. And they understand. I think sometimes people think that you're just making the decision not to do it. But I think that there's, there's help things. And once people know that there's, there's a health reason why you're not doing something, they're not going to keep pushing it. And I think it's, sometimes it's a little bit of education. Grandma may not understand. She thinks you're on that gluten-free fad diet. Um, but sometimes a little bit of education to people saying, Hey, you know, I, I did a test and it said that I couldn't have this or, Oh, I have underlying thyroid issues. And you know, my functional medicine doctor suggests that I stay away from this stuff. People usually at that point are not going to keep pushing you to, you know, they're not going to force a cookie in your mouth at that point. Yeah. All right. So now we've got, we've got the going to somewhere else. We've got that under control. The party's at your house. Everybody's coming to your house. What do you do in that situation? Do you, how do you control it? Do you make multiple different meals? Do you make everything conform to your diet? What's your recommendation there? I can tell you what I personally do. Mm -hmm. I love to cook. So it's, I mean, I've been doing this stuff for years now cooking. So I, it's my mission to make gluten-free healthier food taste good. So I think that when I make a meal, I'm making everything so that I can eat it. I don't, I don't mean to make that sound selfish, but I mean, it's, it tastes good too. I mean, if, and people want to bring something, they certainly can, if they have their little thing that they love to make, make it, that's perfectly fine. But I want to make sure that if I'm going to make a meal, I, I want everybody else, whether they care about their health or not, I'm going to make them care that for that one little meal. And that's my way of, and most people, it'll be a conversation starter. Like, Oh wow, this is gluten free. I would have never, never known. Oh, this is healthy. This tastes amazing. And I think yeah. that putting that meal together in that menu can sometimes be stressful, but there are so many amazing resources out there. I mean, there is an AIP an autoimmune paleo, cookbook, recipe book on every single holiday, every topic. There's so many good ones out there. Um, I, we had interviewed uh, Mickey a couple months ago and I mean, she has great cookbooks um, and recipe booklets specifically for the holiday that can really make it very, very easy for, for a, a, a new person in this realm. And at this point, you know, I have, you know, I have a whole recipe booklet that has all my, my traditional, my traditional favorites now at this point that, I, I cook over and over from year to year. So it's building that, that kind of, you know, history and, you know, knowledge of being able to do it. Yeah. Is the first year going to be kind of scary? Cause you're like, is this going to taste good or is this not going to taste good? You know, the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to get. Maybe that first year, if this is your first year doing it and trying to host it, maybe just make a small little portion of the gluten-free stuff. If you're unsure it's going to taste good and you don't want your guests to be sitting there thinking, oh, this food is, is, is awful type of thing. Or you could try recipes ahead of time. You know, if you've got time, try a few things ahead of time and, and just 
trial, let your family taste it, you know, let them be brutally honest with you as opposed to your, your guests coming in thinking that the stuff tastes terrible. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. If you, if there's a bunch of people coming to your house and, and everybody's got some food sensitivities and things, then yeah, maybe you're making the cleanest food for everybody. And that makes, makes sense. If it's a new experience and you've got a bunch of people who are coming, who um, are, don't have an issue. It's just you. I would make most of most of the food. So a, you can eat it, right? Uh, make sure it, it is a good tasting food. And then depending on your group of who's coming, you may have a, Hey, this is a, this is the stuff for everybody. And this is the stuff for me. Uh, if it's just you, that's the issue. But you know, we've been doing this for a long time in our family. And all, I, I'd say 99% of everything that's been cooked over the, probably the last eight to 10 years is something that everybody can eat. And, um, it's a, it's really for us, it's, we're so used to doing it that it's the norm. Now, when we started, yeah, it was just a couple of us eating gluten, you know, gluten-free versions of things or gluten-free, dairy-free th versions of things. But now it's a, it's a much, much easier experience. And, you know, we have family members who don't, don't abide by a gluten-free diet. And, um, but the food tastes so good all the time. My wife likes to cook, my sister-in-law, my sister. Uh, the food is so good. Um, we don't miss a beat. So I, I think it's, if it's your house and your control, you make the best choice for you. And uh, it is sometimes, yeah, it could be a little bit more, if you're trying to make gluten-free dishes of gluten-full foods, it can be a bit more expensive to do that. So uh, you might say, hey, we gotta go make a lot of this stuff. The people who, who don't, who are gluten-full, great here's your version here's our version and that may make it it makes a little bit of extra work but uh it may save a little bit of, of money and maybe just be a little bit easier mm -hmm. so let's talk about this not that everybody drinks alcohol alcohol but what do you do about alcohol if you're a person who's supposed to be gluten-free what do you do about alcohol during the holidays yeah i mean alcohol we we know has negative effects on the body but during the holidays it's one of those things that you go to a party maybe there's champagne maybe for new year's they've got the the champagne they've got wine at you know christmas dinner you know you go to holiday parties and everybody's you know hanging out i think with alcohol during the holidays try i mean you want to try to avoid it but is is one glass gonna gonna harm you? I think it's gonna come down to the moderation thing. If you feel like you're having anxiety about going to a social event and people are gonna be, why are you not drinking? You know, the, if you feel like you're gonna be pressured, then maybe not go to that event. But if you're around people who understand that you had some health challenges, and you know, again, it's like with the food. If they're gonna pressure you so much, then then maybe not go, or you know, have something that you can drink that's not alcoholic. If you know you you have your your water or most people, if you're drinking something, they're not even gonna really tell a difference that you're you're not drinking along with them. But I, I, I truly don't believe that one one drink is gonna completely ruin. If that's what you want, your one little thing. If you're gonna avoid all the the gluten filled cookies and cakes and all the food, and you just have you know maybe a little glass of wine, then that one glass. I think it's moderation. Um, I think it's you got to choose the alcohol that you you do very wisely um i think there's better than other stuff you know you if you're gluten-free you want to be careful that you're not drinking beer um you know if you're going to drink certain things you, you just want to be careful of the sugar content the mixed drinks i think that you got to be very careful of that and um but if you can avoid it obviously that's that's great but in the holidays again it's with the food if if you're gonna say hey i'm gonna do it then don't don't stress over it either yeah. And so, yeah, you know, alcohol definitely has a negative impact on the body, but it also has a positive, sometimes social impact if it's controlled. Uh, I don't think one, you know, a night out of, of having some alcohol is going to ruin your whole autoimmune paleo process. And it might, could it, you might, it may set you back, but I don't, it, you know, it's a temporary thing. The body will overcome, it'll overcome and adapt. We're not telling everybody to go out and start boozing up for the holiday, but uh, there are, you know, drink, if you're going to drink, moderation is key. Uh, definitely, you know, alcohol, water, alcohol, water. You know, take breaks. Don't you know? Don't overdo it. And I think if you're trying to fit in and you are, but you don't don't want to drink, but you don't want people asking you. The simple thing is just get a you know just get a 
glass of uh, tonic water versus a gin and tonic, right? Just get something, get a, you know, get something that's good, put the straw in, put the olive, you know, the olive in, the lemon, the lime in, whatever it is, you know, somebody can give you a drink that looks just like, or you can make yourself a drink that looks just like an alcoholic drink and nobody knows the difference, right? So um, just be cautious, right? Don't overdo it if you are going to consume. And then if, again, you know, if you're going to have some alcohol, you know, one or two drinks, not the end of the day, again, be aware of how it makes you feel. Um, and then don't stress over it. I drank alcohol. Don't beat yourself up for the next three or four days. Uh, that's probably not helpful. Just be aware. Hey, my body really didn't like that. And I only had one or two drinks. So I had that glass of wine. I had a headache right away. Yeah. That, what it, that's something you want to tell your functional medicine practitioner because that's good information for them. If you drink red wine and, and you're and you have a headache right away, or you drink alcohol and you have a headache right away, uh, that's something we want to know because that gives us some clues as to what what challenges you may be struggling with from a nutrient deficiency standpoint. Yeah, you also have to be careful. You know, alcohol will lower your ability to have self control sometimes too. So. You, you have that glass of wine and then you see those gluten-free cookies over there or the regular cookies and all the food. And, and sometimes then you kind of get in a, a downward spiral where you're like, well, I'm drinking the wine and oh, it, let's just throw everything out the window today. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to splurge on everything. I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat this bread and I'm going to eat these cookies and I'm going to drink this wine. I think that's where you can get in a, a little downward slide is that you want to, you want to pick your uh, your your poison essentially wisely. Is that one can lead to two and three and four different things that really then can make you feel pretty awful for you know the next couple of days or the you know several weeks. So you just want to be careful of that. Yeah, I think that's an important point. I mean, definitely the impact of doing some of this stuff over the holidays can create not just a, a day of not feeling good, but it can it can cause a week or more of sometimes really 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 feeling lousy it can take up to 72 hours for the immune system to rev up following a meal so you may eat and do a bunch of things on one day feel good for the next two days but then it's on day three where you go man i really don't feel good and you may not even chalk it up to what happened three days ago you may just consider it's i'm getting a flu i'm getting a virus but it really may be what happened a few days ago so you got to be be cautious that you don't go totally off the rails have some do the best to have some self-control uh, and I think there was an expression when I was in college, eating's cheating. So they, when, you, when people started uh, drinking, they didn't eat much. So it's one of two things. Sometimes if I just have something that, that out, the, the drink to, sip, to drink or sip on, that may keep them from eating, or other times it may do exactly what you said is, it may set the, uh, the, the chain, break the chains, and somebody may go a little bit haywire. How about... You go to holidays and you get people, I, I, this happened in the office the other day, I was talking to somebody, they brought us a gift, uh, gifts to the office, and that was very nice of them to do that. Um, and then I was talking to them a little bit and they go to a lot of parties and so they're off, they're really been off the dietary um, recommendations for a while because they're like, well, everybody gives me gifts, I have to, you know, what am I gonna do? I gotta, I'm eating the stuff because they gave it to me. It doesn't, you know, they don't know anything about the AIP, you know, they don't know anything about it. So I have to eat it because they gave it to me. What would be your recommendations as people receive gifts, especially food-based gifts that don't uh, comply with maybe an AIP protocol when they're on it or their food intolerances? That's a, that's a hard thing because you don't, someone's giving you a gift and you want to feel very grateful. But I also don't think that you should feel obligated to eat it or even utilize it. Um, I know over Thanksgiving, our office, some, uh, it was, it was actually one of our reps brought us a homemade apple pie. And I was like, I mean, it was in a homemade dish. He had spent a really long time making it. He was so proud of it. And I'm like, that's full of gluten. I'm, I'm, I appreciate, I didn't tell him this, but you know, you take the gift, you say, thank you. But I think that what you do with it, I think you, you have to make that decision. You know, for years, people would give bath and body work. Things. And you know how those artificial smells are endocrine disruptors. And so I don't think you should feel bad if you don't utilize it, or if you really aren't going to use it, then re-gift it. You know, if it's some sort of product that isn't opened, you can 
You could donate it. You can re-gift it to somebody else. If it's a food, find somebody that, that would use it. You know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with, you know, taking it. Just try not to make the person who gave it to you find out because they may have you know, harm, hurt feelings. But uh, I think that you shouldn't feel obligated to have to use it if you know deep down it's, it may set you back. I don't think that that's, I don't think that's worth it. You, you know, you kind of have to weigh out the guilt versus, you know, the negative effects that could happen from, from utilizing it. I mean, it's wonderful. People give lots of gifts and, you know, it's, it's a funny story is when we moved into our house several years ago, our neighbors were moving in as well. And she brought me a whole bunch of cookies for Christmas and come to find out like three months later, we were all hanging out and she's like, you're gluten free. She's like, so what did you do with all those cookies that I gave you? And I was like, well, I gave them to my, I gave them to my staff and she understood. She's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you were gluten free and we had just met. And so she felt guilty and I'm, because I'm like, no, don't feel guilty. I'm like, they went to good use. I gave them to my staff ate them because they, they are not gluten free. And they, you know, so there's, there's a whole avenue that goes along with it. So don't feel obligated that you have to utilize it, but put it to a good use. Don't just throw it away. Yeah, I think just be, I think you just said that well. Just because somebody gives you something that's great. Part of the idea of the holidays, I mean, we get good stuff that you don't want, you don't need all the time. The idea is it makes somebody else feel good to give the gift. I mean, that's the, that's the biggie. If, if I'm giving you a gift, it is this is going to sound selfish, but it is selfish. I'm giving you the gift because it makes me feel good. Right. And so, um, accept the gift, thank the person for the gift, be thankful. Somebody cares enough about you. And then I, I I'm a, I have no problem with the re gift, right? <laughs> Just change the names and, and do the re gift. Cause it's better that you give that to that, whatever that is, if it's, uh, to, you know, food, if it's, 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 some type of object. If you give that to somebody else who is going to put it to good use, I think that that's probably the better option um, than just tossing it in the trash and and creating waste. So there's, no, I, there's always places you can go, you know, donate or even food food banks you can donate some of this stuff to. So you know, don't let it go away. So let let you feel good that you donated it to a good place that right. then you utilized. Yeah, the holidays. It, it's all about giving, but in reality, there's a selfish piece of that. You know, everybody wants to feel good. So if I give you something that makes me feel a little bit better, um, but un unfortunately, um, you know, nobody's going to be, not everybody's going to be aware of what your food sensitivities, food intolerances, your current diet you're following, or even that the fact that, hey, I made a commitment to myself to really exercise and I'm not going to eat all the junk food. The person who's bringing you the the apple pie doesn't know that you made those commitments to yourself and that you want to stick with those. So accept it, be thankful, uh, and then re-gift it, right? Give it yeah. to somebody else yeah. and make good use of it. How about, you know, traveling? What are the recommendations? A lot of people are going to be traveling. What are some of the key recommendations to maintain their health during the holidays for people who are doing a lot of traveling, whether it's driving in a car, whether it's flying in a plane, what kind of recommendations would you give people to maintain their health and well-being? I think the number one biggest thing for traveling is hydration. Whether you're, yeah, if you're in a car, most people aren't drinking water because they're thinking, oh, we're going to have lots of bathroom breaks then. And so people avoid the water and then you get dehydrated. And I mean, that's, that's just never good for your health. And then if you're flying and the air just sucks a lot of the moisture out of the body. So hydration is key. And I would even start that hydration 24 hours before you know that you're going to be traveling, really ramp up your water intake and make sure you have water. Not that you're stopping at a gas station or a airport place and you're picking whatever you have, you know, whether it's the sodas or the fruit juices, be prepared, bring a little cooler with you if you're in the car or, you know, pick you know, water at the airport when you get through security is making sure that you have that hydration with you, I think is going to be really, really big. Um, when you're traveling, the, one of the things that really get disrupted, I think is your sleep. Um, so I think that, you know, planning your travel and making sure whether, whether, you know, you don't sleep well, if you don't have your pillow or your bed, or you're traveling at, you know, weird hours, really trying to make sure that you're not getting too off your sleep cycle because that really could, you know, 
lower your immune system and create chronic stress in the body. And, you know, those things, those things really can have an impact and make you feel kind of crummy. And so when you get to your destination, you don't feel very good. So I think that sleep, I think planning your travel is going to be really, really important for part of that is the, the sleep portion. Yeah. Manage the sleep cycle becomes really important. We know that disrupted sleep is a massive stressor to the, the immune system and to cells and be, you know, one day, maybe not a big deal, but if it's, if it's, if you already didn't have great sleep and now you're spending time traveling and disrupted sleep and your sleep cycles are off, it can be, definitely be one of those things that can trigger, um, you know, a flare of like, like an autoimmune condition or it could aggravate your thyroid condition. Definitely. Uh, hydration, I think is key. And I think the other thing you want to add to that is if you're going to, you're going to, chances of dehydration are greater. Uh, so definitely hydrate. You might even want to think about adding some uh, minerals or salts to the liquid you're drinking because the more you pee and the more you sweat, uh, you're also losing minerals as well. Stress is, there's stress with travel. There's, you know, so it, stress is going to deplete magnesium. So most people that I see are magnesium deficient. So boost your magnesium. But I think maybe the best thing to do is get a good, elect, maybe a good electrolyte powder um, that you can utilize. Uh, you don't need to have it in every uh, glass of water, but definitely it's one of those things to, uh, you could add uh, to um, along with the water to help with just maintaining not only your hydration, but your electrolyte balance. Um, you, I think you're right. When you're traveling, you typically wind up in somebody else's home, on, some, on a hotel, uh, somebody else's pillows. And one of the biggest things that creates problems and, and challenges to cell health is toxicity. And, you know, unfortunately, the mattresses we sleep on, the pillows we stuff our face in, um, you know, the sheets, the, those things can all have some level of toxicity to them. And uh, I know for me, I can't control every mattress I sleep on, but I can control what I stick my face in. And so uh, we travel with our pillows all the time. Uh, it, and yeah, I think that's just one way to, to kind of help support yourself, but definitely consider the fact that, um, you know, you're not going to be able to have total control of, of your sleep environment, but something like as simple as a healthy, clean pillow that you bring from home uh, can be one of those things that can be helpful. Uh, definitely, you know, consider the fact that travel, especially if you're traveling with family, uh, even some, especially with small kids, even big kids, because I got them. Uh, sometimes the most stressful moments are the you know, hours right before you have to go somewhere uh, and leading up to everybody getting in the car. And if you can easily um, create so much emotional stress that that creates a flare of, of, the, of a condition. So I think we need to be really important that, or it's really important to be aware of where your mindset is and that, yeah, hey, having going traveling having people over shopping cooking these things are all things that can if i let them create emotional stress and if you start reinforcing the fact that oh this is stressing me out this is stressing me out it will stress you out right so i think one of those things is that you definitely consider that you have some way to put yourself in check so that you aren't blowing up so that you aren't allowing these little things like nobody wants to get in the picture when I want to get in the picture. Nobody's ready. They're not showered. They're, they're not helping. Those are all things that could drive more stress, cause a, a flare of, of, of a health condition. So find some tool or something to keep you in check. I've talked about things before. Uh, we, you know, definitely you, you, you discussed in the beginning, take, making sure you have take time for yourself, exercise, meditation, um, whether you do yoga, whatever your thing is to help dump some of the stress. Uh, Thanksgiving, you know, Thanksgiving morning, I know we're going to overeat all day at my sister's and, and we, we did, but you know, we still got up, we still exercise, kind of do those things to kind of balance things, those things out. Uh, if you're, you know, you're going to be around the people and a lot of people stress you out, make sure you spend some time, calm meditation. So prepare for, uh, for, for what lays ahead. And then the other thing is have some things to help, you know, remind you that, hey, this is, a joy this is a time to be joyous, not to be stressing and yelling at my family and maybe have, you know, I, you know, wear a rubber band on your wrist to remember, you know, and if you start getting mad, you snap yourself and snap yourself out of it, you know, uh, put it, you know, sounds crazy, but we, I used to have a clown note, a little foam clown nose that I used to keep in my pocket because it's hard to, you know, when you think about a clown and having a clown nose on, it's hard to be upset. 
uh, but have some type of tool or anchor to bring you out of that um, emotional upset because of all the stuff that's going on so it doesn't make you less healthy and it doesn't ruin your holiday weekend. Um, anything you want to add to that? As far as travel, um, there's a couple other things I'll, I'll point out. If you're flying on an airplane, one thing that I I always do when I'm on an airplane is I make sure that the the vent above is not blowing on me. Um, one, that's recycled air, so you're getting everybody else's air blowing on you, as well as there's probably some like plane fumes in there that could be coming. Um, so I always make sure that that's not blowing and blowing directly in my face. Are you still breathing in the air that everybody else is blowing out of those vents? Absolutely. But at least it's not like directly blowing you in your face. Um, one thing that, um, I see often is people taking hand sanitizers all the time. They're reapplying every like five to 10 minutes you know, your, your, your skin has a microbiome and by putting, you know, antibacterial, you know, the gels and stuff on your hands, you may be disrupting your own microbiome. So I get that you don't want other people's germs, but you also have to be very cautious that using that on a very frequent basis may actually be causing more issues. So just be very cautious of that as well. Yeah. And I, I think now that you've said that, I think you, we could talk about a couple of things. Um, you know, what can you do if you're traveling to kind of boost your immunity and we're not trying to fix everything with a supplement, but definitely things like vitamin C, whether it's liposomal vitamin C or just regular supplemental vitamin C can be something that can boost the immune system. Stress is going to deplete it. You only get a day's worth. You're better off eating healthy food, but if you needed to supplement, that would be something that could be so beneficial. Magnesium is going to be one of those things that's going to be easily depleted. B vitamins are going to be easily depleted. Um, and so you could support with a good quality multivitamin or just boost those things at least temporarily during the times when you're most stressed and like and travel would be one of those in my opinion. And then you could think about things like, you know, glutathione as a support product, especially if you're going to be traveling to deal, help with detoxification. And then one of my favorites is, you know, pound down your broccoli sprouts. If you have some a local organic source of them or you're growing them in your kitchen or you can use a sulforaphane based product that you could that supports your natural anti-inflammatory antioxidant system, something to boost that system a bit. So those things can be helpful. Um, Toxicity is huge, you know, and, and it can be a major major factor. So just kind of do what you can uh, to to mitigate it as much as possible. And other thing I would say about travel and I don't know where you are about this and it's people are actually buying gifts too with those things. I think one of the things we want to be careful of is, is we want to kind of minimize the amount of um, manage your, your telephone time uh, manage, you know, I use them like the sound blocking headphones, but I, I see people, everybody wearing the earbuds now and, and things like that. And, and, uh, you're going to be on the phone, you're going to be traveling, doing those things. So my recommendation is if you're going to be on those things a lot, there is some research that shows that people who use their cell phone, have it near their head, use those blue, you know, earbuds and Bluetooth devices that can create more damage to the thyroid gland um, and, and overall health. So I would say if you're going to be on the phone, use the, the definitely use on your phone, use the, or on your car, use the, use the car. But if you're talking on the phone, use the speaker if you can. Uh, if you need a private conversation, plug in your headphones and put those on uh, versus doing the earbuds all the time. I, I really, I'm really concerned about what that, uh, what that long-term damage is going to be. But there is some studies that's showing, hey, just having that cell phone right next to your head can have an impact on, on the thyroid gland. So that'd be one of those things that I would add to that. Yeah, no, and I, we're, it's, it's goes beyond just even the cell phone. Think about when, when you're traveling, you not only have your earbuds in, you have your cell phone then. A lot of times we have the watches that are the electric, the Wi-Fi watches. Um, and, you know, you've got all these things that are very close to the proximity of your thyroid or even your brain. And so then there are some really cool uh, things that you can do to help mediate some of the electromagnetic fields, some EMFs. Um, you know, Hedron is, is one company. They produce lots of different things. I think they even don't they have, a, they have earbuds or uh, headphones now that are very low EMFs? So there's, there's a lot of things out there that you can choose that are less 
less harmful. You know, you're never going to escape EMFs. I mean, they're everywhere. But, you know, when you're on a plane, you're actually getting more EMFs um, just because of the proximity of where you're at. So, you know, you have to consider that, you know, you want to take all those things into account. And if you're looking for somebody a really good gift, some of those things that, you know, block EMFs are really, you, know, you can find tons of different things, whether they're necklaces or bracelets or things that go on your cell phone or things that plug into the wall that help to reduce um, overall EMFs in the environment. Okay. Uh, lastly, what would you say? It, it's a, what would you give as maybe final parting recommendations? I think that it's, you know, you need to enjoy the holidays, but don't let that be a free for all, you know, don't completely jump off the wagon and throw everything you know out the window just because, you know, say I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I want for the next three weeks or four weeks, but you know, however long you're, you're wanting to enjoy the holidays, it do, you can still enjoy the holidays. I think that you, you have to pick and choose your, your battles essentially, but I went throw everything, you know, out the window because you think you're going to pick it back up after the first of the year. And most people don't. That's the hardest thing is that, you know, once you start going down that slippery slope, a lot of times you, there, there's no return. You, you, you then get addicted to the sugar and then you continue eating the sugary things into January and it just, it kind of snowballs. So, you know, slip a little bit, but make sure you're still on that rope so that you can come back up, you know, come after the holidays. There shouldn't be an excuse after that. When the holidays are done, you, you want to get right back on and you want to get back on track with what you're doing, you know, but not stress too much that you got off that you, you can't get back on. Um, and be grateful that, that, you know, enjoy the holidays. I think that not stressing about it, but, but knowing that you're, you can move forward and get through the holidays and enjoy them and be grateful but then get right back on track. Yeah, I would say that when, when people consider, well, the holiday's coming up, so I'm going to do a bunch of bad things, uh, or I'm going to eat a lot, I'm going to drink a lot, I'm going to eat whatever I want. Listen, every month there's a holiday, right? And so what I find is, is that the, the, as you get into, as people start moving away from that, the standard American diet, they start really trying to commit to working on the, their, their health and their well-being, that really what happens is you wind up, the holidays aren't any different really than any other day, right? Because you've, you're making better food choices and those food choices typically become the standard of what you eat on a regular basis. That's your habit. You start to do things in your lifestyle, whether it's meditation or exercise or proper breathing and getting proper rest. So it doesn't change during the holidays. This is, if you're new to trying to get yourself healthy, new to an anti-inflammatory diet, autoimmune protocol, and you're new to trying to get yourself healthy, you're newly gluten-free, dairy-free, whatever those things are, what you're going to realize is the first year is probably the hardest. And then every year after that, it's not a big deal because it just becomes who you are. It becomes the new habit. So you don't go off the rails at the next holiday because it's just not what you do. You figured out how to eat well. You figured out how to drink alcohol. If you're going to drink it you know, appropriately and how to do it. So you're not creating too much stress on the body. Um, you're, you're figuring out how to eat at other people's houses and it's not stressful anymore. So it just, you just change. And so there are these less off the rail experiences because it being a healthier, you just becomes part of the experience. I think it's the hardest when you're new at it, but as you start to go, you know, like I said about our family in the beginning, it was trying to kind of hard trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to eat? Cause it, you know, we got three people here that are gluten free and everybody else wants to eat this. It really isn't hard after a while it becomes the actual norm and all the other stuff, we kind of look at some of that stuff now that maybe we would have eaten and gone, yeah, we're not going to do that. It's just, it's just not, it's not about gluten-free, dairy-free. It's just about health. And we want to be healthy, whether it's the holiday or anything else. And I think to tie in what you said, you know, this is a time to be grateful. And I think one of the most important things we should be grateful for is our, our health and our family and our friends. And the only way to really be truly grateful and get long time experience with them is to be optimally healthy or work to be the healthiest we can be. And if we're constantly doing things that aren't going to be beneficial to long-term health, um, we're not being good to ourselves and we're robbing our friends and our family of their time 
with the best version of us. So I think, you know, if you want to give a gift for the holidays, the best gift that you can give somebody else is the healthiest possible version of you, because that's really what we want. At the end of the day, we want quality time with somebody. And it's a shame when we see somebody leave this earth too soon, we're robbed of that time with them. Uh, and that's a selfish thing many times for us, but we, that's what we want. We want the best version of you, the best version of you know, your, your wife, your kids. And if we aren't trying to do the best things for ourselves on a regular basis, um, I, I think we're really not giving our friends and family the best gift we really could, which is the best version of us. Yeah, I mean, I see it so frequently where people come in and they say, you know, well, I, I can't even go to my Christmas parties or I can't even enjoy this because I've got so much chronic pain or I have no energy. You know, you're robbing your family of time with you as well as what, you know, enjoying your family and your kids, you know, whether that's vacations or parties, you know, having chronic health issues, it, it only robs you of the, the joy in life. So the, the best thing you can do is, you know, be grateful make the best decisions you can, but know that you're doing it for an ultimate cause so that you can have better quality of life, not only for you, but for your family as well. Absolutely. All right. So we will wrap this one up. If this will probably be the, maybe we'll get one more in before the holiday, one more posted before the holiday, but we'll get this one posted just before the holiday. So if you're listening to this, it's probably the Tuesday before Christmas. Um, but uh, we wish everybody a ha healthy and happy holiday. We thank everybody who's joined the podcast and listens to the podcast and shares the podcast uh, with us. We will we'll be back in the new year with uh, season four, and uh, we'll keep it rolling with new guests and new interviews and digging more into thyroid physiology and giving you the answers that you're looking for. So um, for me, for Dr. Erica, everybody have a healthy and happy holiday season. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Merry Christmas, everybody. Yep. Take care.